Hello, everybody, and welcome to Creating Engaging Activities Using H5P. Thank you to everybody who's joined me live. Um, I see I've got a few people here and a few people still joining us. And for those of us watching the recording later, thank you for checking it out. So H5P is this really great tool that is actually open source. Um, developers from all around the world created these, these activity builders, um, and H5P is the gathering place for all of these. And what they are is really um, user friendly, it's a user friendly building platform for HTML activities. And by user friendly, I mean you do not have to know code. Um, but in the end, you get something that you can embed right into D2L. And uh, the beauty of H5P, I think, is really adding that checkpoint of comprehension for students when they're covering, when you're covering materials um, in any kind of online setting, whether or not your course is online, perhaps you just want to have some, you know, online supplemental activities, or maybe you want them to read something online. Um, and what you can do is include a little H5P activity along with those materials as just like I said, an additional checkpoint for comprehension and retention. So let's get started. I would really like to show you guys some examples of instructors that are already using H5P as well as some, some things that are kind of on the frontier of H5P that hopefully you guys will feel inspired to use yourself. Um, right off the bat, I do want to make one clarification. There are um, two different H5P worlds. One is H5P.com, one is H5P.org. Um, what we're talking about today is H5P.org, which is the free one. If you find yourself um, at a website that says, start your 30-day trial here free, um, you are in H5P.com, and you should go to H5P.org because that's the free one. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. So I want to show you guys a couple of examples. There's one instructor in particular that is that has made really great use of H5P and he's actually one of the presenters in the original summit in May. Um, I see some more people joining me. Thank you. And his name is Tim Krause. He presented on um, H5P at our actual summit in May along with a few other instructors and a few you um, folks from online learning. And I'm going to show you what, what he's used it for. And his is, um, I would say, more on the um, self-assessment front, which is what I think a lot of people would use this for um, without the added step of potentially collecting like grades for these activities. So let me share my screen with you all. So here we are at Tim's site. He made this himself, which is really great. Um, it's, it's turned into this resource for the whole ESOL uh, faculty to use. And as you can see, ESOL News Oregon, what he does is he curates um, local news stories and rewrites them based on uh, the level that he is teaching at, you know, ESOL, they've got uh, various levels of, of reading and writing. And what he does is he rewrites it to the certain level he wants. And then at the bottom, he creates these H5P activities. So this is what it looks like. Um, there's lots of different kinds. This one is a drag the word activity. Um, but you could have something like, and maybe we'll see some examples of this later with him, like multiple choice or true false, um, or even some more involved kind of like memory uh, flashcard games. But in the meantime, let's take a look at how this works. So as you can see, we have our questions on the left and we have our options on the right. And I am going to straight up guess all of these so we don't skip a beat <laughs> for those watching at home. So all I did was drag and drop. Pretty straightforward, very user friendly. And here is the check button, and that's how I'm going to find out that I got almost all of them wrong. And so you'll see down here, um, there's this progress bar. If you have multiple activities, um, that's a feature if you use one of the multiple activities, um, or you could just have one activity. And also, you have the option to show solution or to enable a retry button right there. 
Um, I would say for Tim's use, it's, it's self-assessment, right? So um, I, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't use that retry button. Although I have worked with um, instructors previously who do want the students to submit their final grades that they um, did on the H5P activity. And I'll show you how to do that with this in a moment. And they did not want to enable that retry button because they wanted to just have the very first score. Um, and of course, there are ways around that, but um, we're, we're just getting started with H5P, so we're, let's start slow, right? So I'm going to go ahead and show solution. Well, gee, that sure makes a lot of sense that Salem is a city in Oregon and not design. <laughs> um, and then I can retry right there, and it resets the activity for me. Or I can go on to the next one. And what he did with, um, to create these multiple activities, he actually used um, the builder for a slideshow. Um, and that's kind of like, I'd say level two H5P use. Uh, for those of you just getting started with this, I would say, I would say maybe one activity at a time. Um, the slideshow, of course, does enable you to have different kinds of activities within the same um, H5P presentation, right? Um, so it's great, but he's, I, I should just say, you know, off the bat, like Tim's been using this tool for a while, so, so don't worry if you're not to this level right away. So I, so I can show solution, even though um, that choice that he just, just chose actually um, automatically shows the solution, which is like correct, pick the correct statement. Um, so that is H5P in use by one of our instructors as of right now. Um, I'm just going to pause this right there um, because he's got a lot of great examples here. And just kind of circling back to what the point is, why would we use this activity? Um, I think the main thing is we know that the shortest distance that we can get between a student you know, uh, you know, listening to or reading course materials or a lecture and then the point where they, you know, absorb it and there's a kind of like deeper learning happening. The shortest distance we can do between those two things, the better. Um, and we know that the quicker we can get them to practice whatever it is they just learned, the, the shorter that distance is going to be. Um, and so that's what's really great about H5P is it's that checkpoint right away. Right after they read this article, they answer questions about it. And of course, it's low stakes in the case of Tim's use. It's low stakes. It's just for their own self-assessment. But even if that's what you're going to use it for, I think it's a really great supplement for, um, you know, potentially like worksheets or, you know, like reading responses or things like that, or like maybe they're have, creating a journal. Um, although those things are great. And if you want to continue with those, absolutely be my guest. The one benefit of H5P though, is that you can put it right inside of your um, course materials, either on uh, Google Sites as Tim has done here, or um, as I'll show you in a minute, you can put the activity inside of uh, D2L itself. So that's one example. And I want to show you guys, I really love um, the activities he made here. Um, my favorite H5P activity right now is probably the interactive video. Um, I'm not sure how many of you out there are using OER. Yep, I, I think Nancy, um, Nancy who's joined us, she's, she's one of the OER folks. And I know that a lot of people are really on the uptick of adopting OER into their courses for lots of reasons, right? And so that usually means a lot of um, material from other places, namely, you know, Khan Academy or videos from YouTube, right? And so if you're using any kind of video, whether it be some, a lecture that you have recorded yourself or something you borrow from elsewhere, um, the interactive video is actually this uh, H5P activity where you can pause the video ask the student a question, and then the video continues on. And once again, you can collect the answers for these, um, even with the free version. I know some of you are familiar with the paid, the paid like user license version. Um, and PCC 
is on a very limited basis, uh, does have access to the paid version, um, but there are not um, user licenses available just yet for, for the majority of faculty. So what we really want to do is have everybody get started with the free h5p.org, get a feel for it, and then um, hopefully with growing momentum, there'll be funding for more user licenses. Even without the h5p.com paid version, again, I think h5p.org is just a really great opportunity to create those checkpoints. And as I'll show you in a little bit, you can still collect submissions, collect answers um, for people's performance on these, right? So interactive video next. Let's see. Um, I am partial to Harry Belafonte. Um, this could be your chance, though, if you want to submit um, a video. Who would you like? What's somebody's favorite song right now? Go ahead and put it in chat. Yeah, okay, so Christopher confirmed it. Harry Belafonte is the best. I agree, so I'm just going to stick with him. So I've got my video pulled up here, as you can see, but um, I'm going to take, take us back a notch. And I am going to put us in h5p.org. Um, so actually, before I show you how to make an interactive video, I am going to show you what h5p.org, a little bit of navigation stuff, right? So you'll go to h5p.org and you'll, you know, set up your account. They'll send you an email to confirm. And then you'll get here and you'll log in. So to create content, you're going to go to my account. And you can try out H5P here, or you can go to contents to view what you've made already. And uh, this is all, also where you can make new content. So I'm going to click right on create new content. And it's going to give me all of my content types. Uh, as you can see, there are a ton available here. And um, absolutely explore these at your leisure, right? Um, Let's see here. Right now we are looking for interactive video. And oh, I knew I went right past it. So you'll see all of these have this little details button to the right. If you're like, well, what in the world is this? Because some of these get a little bit um, less intuitive, where you're like, what, what does this mean? Uh, you know, guess the answer, of course, none of, all of those make sense. But personality quiz, it's like, what is that? Um, if you click on details, it'll actually show you some screenshots. Um, or you can look at a content demo. <clears throat> excuse me, an example of that activity in play. So I'm going to go back up to interactive video. And first thing, of course, I'm going to add a video. So I can upload a video if I have recorded it, or I can grab it off of YouTube um, or any other URL, of course. So I'm going to grab it right from the address bar. Sometimes I know um, it asks for that just that video ID, but we're going to grab the whole address, paste it. Great. And then I can either go add interactions or add interactions. It'll get you to the same place. Um, before I do, there are a few things that um, you have the option of kind of filling in every detail of these activities, although it's not required. The title is required. Um, so let's give this, let's see, Deo Interactive Video. The title is required. Um, but the rest of this, you know, you don't have to have a short description if you don't want, although that might be a great place for you to kind of qualify why they're watching this video or what they should, you know, get out of this video. And later on, we're going to, um, look at some of these other behavioral settings. But in the meantime, I, I want to add some interactions. So here is our video. I press play. And there he is. And as you can see, um, we're very familiar with this kind of button. Partially because it's YouTube, we, we can't avoid those ads that pop up. You know, you might get lucky and find a video that hasn't been discovered and has no ads, but it's, uh, you know, the, the beauty and, and one of the setbacks of YouTube, right? But here we are um, on the timeline, and you're going to just 
drag this timeline to where you want to put an interaction. So I'm going to find after he says one thing. Daylight come and me one go home. All right. So he says, daylight come and me one go home. So I have found where I want to add my interaction. I pause the video. I come up to the top. And here are my options for interaction. So um, I can add text. I haven't used the label yet. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I can add text, which is really just like straight up putting a statement on the screen. <clears throat> Maybe you want them to take particular note of what's happening. Um, or just highlight something that's just been mentioned. You might put text. You can put a table. You can put a link. You can insert an image. Over here are some of the actual, um, you know, the student has to do something. Here's pick the correct statement. Here's um, single choice set. Here's multiple choice, um, which is really a lot like multiple choice, single choice set is. We have true, false. We have fill in the blanks. Um, we have drag and drop, mark the words, drag the text, crossroads, which it's, that's um, kind of beta. Um, I haven't actually used that yet but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> and navigation hotspot where they could, um, you know, be taken to something else. So I want to add, I'm going to add a multiple choice question. So I click on multiple choice and right away up here, it says display time. And you're going to notice that it starts out. It automatically gives you 10 seconds of like this interaction is going to be displayed for 10 seconds. If it's a question and you're going to pause the video, you don't actually need to display it for that long um, because it's going to pop up. The video is going to pause. It's going to pop up and then they're going to answer it and then continue on and press play. So generally speaking with the times I'm asking a question, I just do it for one second. Um, if you are adding text where you're just like telling them something on the screen, um, I would say do it a little bit longer. Make sure you give it, give them enough time to actually read what you're typing in, right? Um, but here I have paused the video. I've got my display time. And then next, display as. It can either be a little button, um, which is uh, quite literally looks like that. It's like a little hand that's like sort of telling the user to click here, although there's nothing explicitly saying click here. Um, so what I actually prefer is the poster. Um, and that's something that can take up the whole screen if you wanted. So, We'll say day of multi. Okay, so um, you can add, so here's like a kind of a next level thing. You can add additional media on top of the um, question text. Maybe there's like something in the textbook and you have an image of it and it pertains to this. Um, again, that's kind of next level. I don't think that's what most of you would would really be working with that first, but that option is there. You can really layer these things with a lot of information um, to, to um, work with. But moving on to the question, what happens when daylight comes? Um, for this multiple choice, it, you can see you put in your options and then you mark which one is correct. You'll notice um, in the single choice set, which is something I'll show you in a moment, um, you have to actually put the correct answer first. So just to make a note of that, on this one, we can put the correct answer wherever we want. So I'm gonna start with the wrong answer actually. So what happens when daylight comes? You want to go dance. Next option, you want to go home. I'm gonna add a third option. You want to go to sleep. Um, and I'm doing that a little bit strategically here because um, daylight comes and you would think want to go to sleep. So this one is actually a semi-logical choice. And the thing about that is if you, um, so here you, you can enable feedback. So if they pick this choice, you can tell them, you know, you would think it's time to dance, but it is actually time to go home rewind and listen again, right? Something like that. And then this one, if it's selected, you could say exactly. 
Um, and then, of course, if it's, you can add feedback if it's not selected. Um, it'll get a little busy with feedback if you choose to do every time message displayed if answer is selected and message displayed if answer is not selected. It can get a little busy. So I tend to just do if this answer is selected. And finally, here's our logical second choice, which it would make sense that someone would choose that, but it's incorrect, right? So if answer selected, we could say something like, so close, I can see. Well, it makes sense that you'd want to go to sleep, but if you listen again, he actually wants to go home. You can continue to add options here. I, I think the, um, you get up to seven options with the multiple choice. And then the overall feedback, if you would like to provide feedback like this, they have the exam up here examples of, you know, if they get a zero to 20%, you could say something like, you know, that was really rough. I think you should try again. <laughs> um, you know, 21 to 91 is like, hey, you did it, that works. And you know, 90 to whatever. Um, and you can create your ranges here. You can add range. Um, and I'm going to skip that for now. Um, down here, behavioral settings. So this is where we are going to either enable or disable these things. So enable the retry button. Unless you have a good reason not to, the default is to enable that retry button. Um, also with the show solution, unless you have a good reason not to, if you're trying to collect scores, if this is an actual submission for a grade, um, you wouldn't really want those at first, right? But if it's a study guide, let them, you know, try as many times as they want, right? And let's see, require answer before solution can be viewed, that makes sense, right? And pass percentage. So, you know, if you have, if you're going to require them, well, this is really, this is really if you're going to have points. And as of right now, it's not going to be feeding directly into the grade book. Um, I'll talk about more, more about that a little bit later. And it would just be them self-reporting. So um, these are less important at the moment, but really it's these enabled retry, enabled show solution, and randomized answers. Down here on adaptivity, it's another chance to um, add some feedback if they get them all right or if they get them all wrong. Um, if they get them all wrong, you can actually send them back to the beginning of the video. Um, if you notice, enter time code in the format minute, second, second. That just means like minute one, second, tw 10 seconds, right? Great. And you can also require a full score um, for the task before proceeding. And that's going to be um, up here, um, past percentage, right? It's going to be corresponding to that. All right, so I've checked on all my settings. And now um, the only final setting that I would say pay attention to is this allow download. I would actually disable that so you don't allow a download. Um, keep the embed button in there. But if you allow download, they might actually download it. And I, um, H5P misbehaves, I've noticed, <laughs> if it doesn't stay where it, was, where it was put originally. But the embed button we actually need, so make sure that's checked. All right, I've got my video. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and save. And on the next page, it's going to give me a preview of the final content, right? So here's our video. And here is our multiple choice question. This is how the interactions will show up. So you can preview it again. Oh, I just realized I forgot one thing. So um, when we made our poster, I mentioned that you could go, you could cover up the full screen. Um, I actually forgot to edit the size of that poster. So this is the default size that will pop up but I'm gonna go ahead and go back in and edit because I wanna make that poster a little bit bigger. So to edit my interaction, I'm gonna come back to add interactions. I'm gonna find this spot, click inside, and this menu appears, and then I go to the little pencil, right? So I actually don't need to edit anything inside here, but if you notice when I clicked inside, I should have clicked done instead of save, but 
what are you going to do? When I clicked inside, it actually did give me the option of resizing this. So I'm just going to drag it and make it bigger, Put it right in the middle. That's better. Save. Great. Here's our interactive video. And when they get to, they have to answer this. Okay, how do you put this in your course? See this little embed in the bottom left-hand corner? That's why it was really important that you guys keep it open. Um, keep that checked. So embed, you're gonna go ahead and copy. You're gonna select all, and you're gonna copy by Control C. That's shorthand anyway. And then inside of D2L, or really wherever you're going to be putting this at HTML, I'm going to go edit HTML inside of my file. And you guys may not have gotten this far inside of D2L yet, but this is actually the source editor. This is where we're going to paste our code. Um, I know this can be a little bit freaky, but um, I think the key to any kind of uh, code is just going in with your exact task in mind and not messing with anything else, right? <laughs> Unless you know how to mess with stuff and then mess away. Um, but I'm going to click on my HTML source editor. And what's very important is that I put it between the body tags. So these are called tags, I, I mean, I believe. Um, I'm going to put it in the line. And if it looks like this, or if you don't see a line, you just go up here and click enter to make a new line. Okay. And if you get stuck on this part, absolutely get in touch with your instructional technology specialist at one at each campus. And um, we can uh, very quickly walk you through this. Um, and it gets easier every time, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and paste in here. There's that code, the embed code from our H5P activity. And I'm gonna click save. And then there it is. And we have our, our interaction here. Okay, so. There's my feedback. You would think it's time to dance. I'm going to retry. Me want to go to sleep. So close. Retry. Me want to go home. Great. Oh, you guys, I didn't mark that one as correct. <laughs> Let's go back in and mark that one as correct really quick, shall we? <laughs> Sorry about that, you guys. Add interactions. We're going to edit this. We're going to mark that one as correct. So this is part of learning H5P. Even though, you know, I would say that I have learned it at this point, but there's always stuff like that. And um, I'd say the key to trying anything new and anything with technology is that you just test out the user experience because that's where you will find all the bugs and all the mistakes like I just found. So um, the good news is since I updated it in H5P, it'll actually update wherever this code lives. So now it's marking it as correct, right? And I would click continue to, um, to close out that activity and continue watching the video. Work all night. Um, if you noticed, after I um, answered that, this little pop, this little um, star lit up because it collected my answer. And so this is what I'm talking about when, I'm, when I mentioned that the students can self-report their scores. Um, if you just have them send you a screenshot of this exact moment, and you can collect scores that way on these H5P activities. And like I said, if you are um, disabling retry and disabling show solution, uh, there's a good chance that you're going to be getting really accurate scores from these students. So it's something to consider. Or maybe, again, you just want to use it as a checkpoint, as a study guide for these students. <clears throat> OK, let me pause right there and see if anybody has any questions. OK, I see James has a question. <clears throat> he says, how does it work when you migrate their score into D2L? So here's the thing. H5P.com is fully integrated with D2L you can have H5P activities report to the gradebook. However, H5P.org 
is not integrated with D2L. The free one is not integrated. So you can have them self-report their scores. Perhaps they take a screenshot and they upload it to an assignment folder or they just email it to you. Um, and that's one way to collect scores. But if you are um, looking to, you know, wire your course to have H5P activities and have them feed right into the grade book, what I would recommend is you make your activities in h5p.org, you get in touch with one of us um, instructional technology specialists, one of us at every campus, um, and I'll post the link to that. And we'll, uh, we'll have the link uh, at the bottom of the video for you to get in touch with them as well. Um, and we have, we have access to um, insert that for you. So if you have your activity, you have it built, um, get in touch with us. You can, we can basically upload it to our user account, put it in <clears throat> your D2L shell, have the grade book item and have it report all the way through. And you know, in the future, there might be a good chance that you yourself can get a user account, especially if you have used the tool quite a bit. Um, because we've seen, you know, some people get user accounts and then maybe the tool just doesn't work for them. Um, and so we're, we're uh, pretty, pretty, what should I say? Um, we're just careful. And we're working on, you know, funding for these things. It's going to really be up to the departments, I think, when it comes down to it. But as we know, um, we probably shouldn't wait on things like that, right? Especially when we have this free tool available to us. So that's the interactive video, and that's a kind of like a snapshot about the grades, right? Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and move on. I'm going to go back a step here. Um, I wanted to show you guys something that I made for um, a different program. This is actually for a non-credit course, and they were originally using worksheets. Um, they would have a Word document, and you might, you, you guys might be doing this as well. It's super common. They have an assignment, which is basically a, a Word document attached, and then the student has to download that document, fill it out, and then re-upload it. Um, and D2L is perfectly outfitted to, to, to do that, to do exactly that. Um, but when, I, when they got in touch with me, I mentioned that H5P might be a good replacement for those Word documents. And so we went ahead and transferred them all into these activities. So for them, um, they are collecting grades. And this is something that I worked on with them. So it, it does feed into the grade book. And basically, um, it's, I have a question set here. So there's 16 questions in the multiple choice section and a true false section. Um, it's not saying how many, but that looks like what, 12? And then a matching definition section where they have to drag the letter to the correct thing. And so this used to be a Word document, but um, we have set it up to be inside of D2L and it's been working really well. Um, we've gotten some really good feedback from students, so I'm excited about this. And again, I'm happy to collaborate with anybody. And if you come to me with an activity, I would love to be stumped one of these days because so far, so far, it's been pretty good. I've been able to convert um, anything that I found, any kind of activity, into an H H5P activity. Um, and so, like we saw in Tim Krause's site, uh, we've got some basic kind of like multiple choice, true, false, um, choose the correct answer, drag the correct letter, um, things like this that are going to be very familiar for the student, except now they get to complete it um, all in one place they don't have to download and re-upload, which, you know, again, if it works, it works, but you might have, <laughs> this can be a little bit more automated, I think. Um, you don't have to worry about file types. Huh. Imagine. So I'm going to show you how to make um, this first one a question set because um, it's a little bit of a, um, a point of clarification about a multiple choice versus a question set. So. Let's scooch back into H5P. Here I am in, in my account. Contents. There's my interactive video. I'm going to create new content. 
And here is question set. So I already showed you, um, oh, I didn't show you the inside of a uh, multiple choice. Let me show you that really quick. So you know kind of what I mean when I compare the two. So don't let me go past it, okay. So here is um, the multiple choice inside of it. And the one bummer with um, using the actual multiple choice question builder is that you only get one question per builder, right? So you would have to, you know, create each question in this interface individually. And it does allow you to pick the correct answer. Oh, we did do multiple choice just, just a moment ago with the interactive video. What am I talking about? So you, you saw that we had to pick the correct answer, which I forgot to do at first, right? Um, and so the difference between this, I'm gonna go ahead and back out of here. Oh, what's a good way to back out? Let me do the classic arrow back, <laughs> when in doubt, right? Um, so I'm gonna move on to that question set and show you how it's a little bit different. So question set, um, you know, so this just means you can have many different questions. It's much more like a quiz, but with HIP instead of the um, people quiz tool. And which means it can be embedded directly with your content versus the quiz tool, which is great, but it is a separate space. Um, so it's really up to you what you want to use this for. But the question set, if you're going to be asking like more than one multiple choice, I recommend just going straight to the question set and you're going to create every question. So here's a multiple choice question number one. My question is, what month is Thanksgiving in? <laughs> um, Oh, you know what, you guys? Actually, this looks like it's been recently updated, and I think I saw an email about this being updated. Um, what I was going to tell you, the clarification, the difference between the two. Um, so it's still true that you can do multiple questions with the uh, question set, but previously you had to put the correct answer first, and now it looks like we are allowed to pick which one is the correct answer, which is just great. All right, we'll do this pretty straightforward then. What month is Thanksgiving in? December, ooh, it's not in December. January, add option, November. No, she gets November. <laughs> Anybody else remember no, that was a thing when, when all the men would have beards in, in November all of a sudden? Um, okay, so I'm gonna pick this as correct. And again, I can add feedback for the other choices if I want, if it's like an almost correct answer, um, I, I do recommend that. And again, you can have a range where it gives them that additional feedback of, um, you know, not great or great, right? And with here, um, you can do more than one question though, so I'm gonna add a question. And this time, let's have it be a true false. Question number two. That's my title. The question is, is the sky blue? And the answer is, I should say false because it's gray, right? <laughs> Our sky is gray, <laughs> but it's true. Come on. It's true. The sky is blue. And again, down here, you'll see that you have the options for show, check, and um, if you want to. So it's, it's worded a little a little bit differently instead of enabling the show solution button it says override show solution so the default is for them to show solution so you should always look at these settings if you're concerned with those particular um, features and if you have something specific in mind you should always check these because they might look a little, a little different from activity to activity because it's actually um, a whole community of developers that built these activities it wasn't just one company um, great, and then we've got down here, allow download or the embed button, right? And for now, I'm gonna save this. I kept my embed button on there, and so I grab this embed code. Come back in here. Um, how about I go a step back? Maybe you don't, um, you haven't ever created a, a HTML web page, so we'll just do that really quick. You'll go up here and you'll create a file it, um, it is a web page, but it's technically a file inside of this course. 
Oh, he's right. HIP continued. All right, and so I click inside of the body. I come down to my HTML source editor. I click inside of these body tags and I paste. And so here's my activity. Great. Move on to the next one, sky blue. And again, you can have them self-report by taking a screenshot. Um, it will show them the results. Um, with the interactive video, they do have to do that additional step of like clicking on that star in order to show their, their full um, result. Um, but with here, it just shows up when they finish. So let's save and close. And that's generally speaking, like the nuts and bolts of HIP. Um, I do want to encourage you guys, again, we're kind of at the, um, at what, the not the cutting edge, but at the frontier of using this. Um, some of these activities have not been even explored or created by PCC faculty yet. So when you're back in H5P land, um, you can always go to examples in downloads. So each one of these is going to have an example. Um, as I mentioned, when you're actually creating the activity, you can go to details and this, this um, same information is available. Um, but if you wanted to use something, you can explore these content types, right? And um, each one of these is an example that you can actually reuse if you wanted. Um, there is this embed code down here if you wanted to, to grab it. Um, I've actually seen some ESOL people use some of these activities. By and large, the ESOL um, department at PCC has used this the most. So if you're an ESOL faculty, um, I would poke your head around because maybe they've already made something and are willing to share it with you. Um, we are hoping eventually that, you know, department-wide or SAC-wide will have a kind of library of PCC activities that we can share um, in the spirit of OER, right? In the meantime, though, there are these examples that you can reuse if you'd like. Or if you just want to explore and start making stuff, honestly, I think that's the best way to get to know the tool. Um, all of those interface, every time you create an activity, it's gonna look pretty, pretty much the same with, you know, you choose your activity. Oh, I'm already there. You choose your activity, your kind of activity, right? Um, and that's, details is gonna show you what it's, the final product is supposed to look like. And you just get to know what you've got to do. It's like go piece by piece. If something's required, it's going to prompt you. And if it's not required, it means the activity will still function without it. So I don't think, I think it's pretty safe. You guys can't really break anything. <laughs> um, and I should say myself included, I can't really break anything. So, you know, the sky's the limit. Feel free to just get in there and explore. Um, so I do want to pause. Does anybody have any questions for me? give everybody a minute to kind of digest that. Thank you all for joining me live, by the way. Um, and for those of you, again, watching, watching this after the fact, thanks for checking out HYP. Um, I don't think I told you guys who I am. I'm Casey Twining. I am the Instructional Technology Specialist over at uh, Rock Creek. And like I said, there's one of us at each campus. And um, our job is to help you with all things instructional technology, um, namely D2L, that's the big one. Um, of course, that's the one we all use the most, right? Um, but we also have, each have kind of like specialities. Um, Andre, who's on the call right now, he is really fabulous with like video editing software like Camtasia. So I, we usually like recommend uh, faculty to, to the appropriate person for their specialty. Um, Melanie is like, you know, coding, oh, what, geez, <sighs> kind of like Jill of all trades, honestly. Um, and um, Michael is uh, uh, at Cascade, and he's a CIS um, instructor as well. So again, he's like web development. Um, and yeah, we are here, we're here for you. So if you have any questions about stuff, um, especially H5P, I think I'm like the uh, current H5P like cheerleader person. So you might get sent to me either way, but any of the ITS are able to help you. And I am seeing that I have a question in chat here. Let's see. So this is from Nancy. 
She says, if I'm working on OER stuff, I'll eventually want my H5P content on my final site. Can I transfer it once it's in D2L or do I have it on H5P somewhere? So um, it'll be in D2L if you embed it, but um, like we're looking at the screen right here, it's gonna, your stuff is gonna be saved in the cloud. And it is worth noting that um, it's technically public when it lives on h5p.org. So no like crazy sensitive material, not that anybody would do that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's stored in the cloud, whatever the cloud is. Um, we, you know, we, it's just somebody's computer somewhere else, right? But you have access to it whenever you need it. You'll, you won't lose access. So as you're transferring things into D2L, um, and for some reason, maybe you're not copying content from one shell to the other, uh, you can always come back to H5P and find directories. Um, and really, that's it. I can't uh, encourage you guys enough to just like give it a try, h5p.org, um, and see how you like it. And if you get stuck, you can always call um, the faculty help desk for one which is extension 8227, or you can get in touch with your instructional technology specialist at your campus, um, and they'll be able to help you out as well. So um, that's it for my presentation. Thank you all for joining me, and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you at the future Encore presentations. <laughs>